All right, welcome to AI's Underbelly, the Zero Day Gold Mine. Now, I have two messages here for you today. One is you don't need to know anything about AI to hack AI. And number two, pen testers should be actively seeking out AI infrastructure on all their pen tests. Why? Because AI engineers are very highly privileged users who have access to massive amounts of data. So I'm going to show you some practical examples of how to do that today so you can go home uh, and try this out on your own pen tests. My name is Dan McInerney. Uh, I've been a hacker for about 15 years, open source development. Uh, last three years or so, I've been focusing on machine learning. So I have like a sports prediction model that I use myself to predict UFC fights. It's been profitable. And so I tried to meld those two interests together, and I became a full-time AI security researcher uh, about a year or two ago. So let's go over the agenda. Uh, we're going to do AI security first. If you get your AI security news from the media, you probably have a lot of misconceptions. So I'm going to clear that up. I'll show you how to hunt zero days in AI tools. Then I'm going to show you some practical examples from the zero days I've found and how to use those right now. And then I'll show you how to join the hunt. There's very few security researchers in the AI world. The barrier to entry is almost nothing. It's really, really easy. We have an AI bug bounty program. It pays thousands and thousands of dollars to find vulnerabilities in libraries that have literally never been security tested. It is a strange field. And I'll show you how to do that. So first off, if you've heard all your AI security from the media, you probably think the only issues in AI security are chat GPT prompts, like jailbreaks and things, or when chat GPT becomes sentient, it's gonna wipe out humanity. Now those are actual valid issues, I guess. Uh, but they're not really the most practical attack surface when a company employs AI engineers and builds an AI product. This is the pyramid of disaster in the AI security world. At the very top, we see model inputs. That's going to be chat GPT jailbreaks, indirect prompt injection, stuff like that. I find that as a pen tester to not be that useful on pen tests. If I'm trying to attack your organization and you have an AI department, I'm not gonna try and take over your LLM through prompts. I'm gonna use a different route. Underneath that, we have the model file. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, an AI model is kind of the output of the AI engineering pipeline. A model is just a programmatic object. There's nothing mystical about it. If you go to Python, you type in x equals xgboost.xgb classifier. x is a model. You can feed it data to train it, and then you can feed it data to make a prediction. That's it. Now, if you want to save that to disk, then you have to serialize it. So you have to take it from memory, serialize it, and save to disk. The problem is the most common serialization format is to use Pickle. And Pickle allows command execution and injection into the serialized files. So think about this. You have a model file. You save it to disk. You send it to one of your friends or email it somewhere. They inject their own arbitrary commands into that model file and then email it back to you. As soon as you run that model, those arbitrary commands will run on your machine. And the model still works. That's the crazy part. So that's a very practical attack. I mean, you send that as a phishing attachment, it looks far less suspicious than a PDF file or a Word document with a macro in it. But that brings us to the elephant in the room, which is the AI supply chain. The AI supply chain is a collection of all the tools that AI engineers need to use to get their job done. That's tools they use to deploy models, tools they use to share models, uh, all those kind of things. So that's actually where I'm going to focus here today. That is the practical attack path. This is a very new industry, and so a lot of these tools have had zero security testing whatsoever, and I'll demonstrate that in a second. Conceptually, you can think of AI security kind of like mobile security from the 2010s. It's an emerging technology. They have new tools for development, new tools for deployment, a couple novel security vulnerabilities like, you know, Android manifest files might have too many permissions. Those are, those are fine. I mean, they're novel, but they're not really how a hacker is hacking mobile applications back in the 2010s. For example, someone downloaded the Domino's Pizza app in 2016, sent off their payment information after buying a pizza, and realize you can intercept the response and flip decline to accept. And then you get a free pizza. Do you think the dominoes.com had that vulnerability? No, but the mobile application did. This is just like 
everyone gets amnesia as soon as a new technology comes out and forgets what API security is. And yet that's the practical attack path. That's how you get free pizzas. Now I'll show the patterns that I've seen in AI vulnerabilities. The source of the problem and the source of these patterns. Number one, emerging technologies have to be convenient for the user to use and they have to be fast in development. Now I'm not gonna sit here and preach and say, well I can't believe they would increase the speed of development at the expense of security. There's perfectly valid economic reasons why you would want to maybe not focus on security as much in the early stages of emerging technology like mobile applications, 3D printers, or AI. So I'm not here to like preach and proselytize. I'm just here to show you the consequences of that and how you can use that as a pen tester or a hacker. Second problem is developers of AI tools have a strange thing. The AI industry is an insular bubble. Very few people come from outside the AI industry and move into it. Most of these people grew up in AI studying it in college and then getting an AI job right afterwards. So what I've seen is that you don't have a lot of developers of AI tools that come from secure coding backgrounds. There's not that many system administrators that are bouncing over into the AI industry and writing tools for other AI engineers. It's AI engineers writing tools for other AI engineers. And the problem with that is that they're just finding friction points in their own workflow and then writing a tool to solve that and sharing it around. And since it's a small community, those tools get extremely popular. But they have zero security testing because these people don't come from secure coding backgrounds. That's the stage we're at right now. Now the manifestation of these problems is there's no authentication almost anywhere in the industry. It is bizarre. There's way too much access to the file system in all of these tools for sharing models and creating models. Insecure network configurations, insecure model storage formats like Pickle, and unsanitized user input. But I mean, that kind of goes in in the regular software development industry as well. Here's the most common vulnerabilities I've seen. We have file include, local file include. That comes back to way too much file system permissions, cross-site scripting, server-side request forgery is an interesting one. A lot of these AI tools, in order to be convenient to the user, have to be able to reach data at an external place. So like, if you're using a tool that trains a model, maybe you need it to go fetch data from an S3 bucket. What a lot of the developers don't realize is that you can use that as an internal proxy. So let's say I'm at home on my laptop and I see an AI tool that creates models up on some you know, corporate website. I can tell that AI tool, hey, don't fetch data from S3, fetch the internal network configuration file from the router or fetch the internal cloud configuration file. All of those are not accessible to me on the external network but I can use these AI tools as a proxy using server-side request forgery to find requests or to send requests to the internal network and get sensitive data. It's an interesting one. Arbitrary file overwrite, again, too much access to the file system. And the big one, remote code execution. This is the holy grail for us hackers and pen testers. It makes it so easy to get further into the network and get credentials and do the credential shuffle. And for some reason, I'm seeing this all over the place in AI tools. And I think it's coming from the fact that a lot of these developers grew up in AI and not in secure coding practices at a company like Twitter or something like that. And so they just think it's convenient to allow their tool to do remote code execution because it probably is convenient. But it's a problem for the security and that is for sure. So here is the most common vulnerable API call that I've seen over and over this API call keeps popping up with RCE, LFI, SSRF. Now in the AI world, an artifact is a model file. It's an artifact of the AI engineering pipeline. So this is essentially the same thing as saying get file. But look at this. All of these tools have a get artifact API call. And all of them have a nasty vulnerability in it. Even GitHub had a get artifact API call with a remote code execution. Now one of these says not public yet. The reason for that is because we are running the AI bug bounty program and this is uh, not public yet. I mean, it's, it'll get published I think in a month or two. And I could have filled this table out with even more examples, but I didn't just want to fill it all out with not public yet. So I was kind of wish I was giving this talk maybe like a month or two later because we have a treasure trove of nasty vulnerabilities, remote code execution, 
anonymously in extremely popular AI tools. But come back to that in like a month or two and keep up to date. You'll see a lot of cool exploits. So let's look at some real world examples of the zero days I found. Now this XKCD is a little bit overused, but that's only because it's so accurate. So if this was an XKCD in the AI security world, the first panel would say something like, academic researchers found given infinite computing resources, anybody can copy ChatGPT's model by abusing the algorithmic code underneath. And how it actually works would be one guy sitting in his underwear at his home computer going, oh look, Google exposed an ML flow server. Somebody, somebody else asks, okay, well did you grab the SSH keys from it? He goes, yes. Then I sprayed them around the network and now I'm domain admin. That's how real AI hacking works. Example number one is MLflow. Now this one's near and dear to my heart because it was the one that really like opened my eyes to the level of security that exists in AI world. So I had just started the Protect AI doing full-time AI security research and I started talking to my colleague who is an excellent machine learning engineer, Chris King, and I asked him, what's the one tool in the AI world that if you were able to get an exploit in it, would cause the most amount of chaos and damage. And he's sitting there and he thinks, well, that's probably MLflow. Now software engineers have GitHub for their software repositories. AI engineers have MLflow as their model repository. This is where you store all of the trained models that might make your company millions of dollars. It might do profit forecasting, it might do customer forecasting, it, it, anything you want. Additionally, MLflow has data storage too. So if someone pops your MLflow server, you are screwed. Your entire AI engineering department's output and everything you've worked toward, maybe models that took millions of dollars to train that are worth your profits, those are all taken by the hacker. So I'm like, that sounds good. I'm gonna go ahead and download this tool. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's just a web UI. You just do pip install MLflow, MLflow UI. Kicks off a web server and a programmatic interface. 15,000 GitHub stars, I think 10 to 15 million downloads a month. It's wildly popular, and yet I'm sure none of you have heard of this, unless you're in the AI world. You can see there's a thousand public available servers right now. So I download it, and the first thing I notice is no authentication. Now this blows my mind that something that holds, holds such sensitive data, like all of your corporate secrets that were used to train a model that you use in your corporate environment, doesn't have authentication. And that sends off red flags in my head thinking this cannot be securely coded. So I start poking around the application and I see a full file path. Right there, anytime if you're a web application hacker, you see a full system file path, you're gonna go, that has got to be vulnerable. And in fact, it was. Now, what's happening in this top, link, top uh, screenshot here is MLflow lets you dictate where it's going to store the models. So I told it, gosh, I'd like to store the models in .ssh, my private SSH folder. Then I told it, I would like to get artifact, if you remember that call, and I'd like the artifact you get to be ID RSA, my private SSH keys. And it just spits it out, happily. Now, to, to summarize this vulnerability, an out of the box MLflow installation with zero authentication requires three API calls to steal any file on that server. SSH keys, models, data, whatever you want. It's all there for the taking. You, you saw those thousand servers there? When I found this bug, that is a thousand organizations that have exposed an internal network foothold for anybody. So of course I automated this process and I wrote a tool called Snake MLflow, which goes and automatically gets the SSH keys, the cloud keys, because that's actually an interesting point here, is MLflow from my research, about 80% of the deployments reach out to an S3 bucket to get data to train the models. Now how does it reach out to that AWS cloud environment? It uses the AWS credentials that are stored in .aws slash credentials on the operating system. And what can you do with MLflow? Steal any file on there. So not only are you getting high privilege SSH keys from the AI engineer, you're also getting high privilege cloud keys if it's set up to deploy and grab data from an S3 bucket. So I wrote a blog post about this. Uh, MLflow developers were fantastic. They got this fixed very quickly. Uh, all respect to them. 
but wrote a blog post about it, and within two weeks, the patches they made for the LFI were bypassed. So I wrote a new blog saying system takeover and ML flow strikes again and again. As of today, that blog post should probably read again and again and again and again and again and again with increasing severity. It just keeps happening. Here's an example of a patch bypass. Instead of right here, it says file colon slash slash dot etc. Before, you could just put the full file path. Now, you just put a dot and then the full file path. That's the level of security we're dealing with in one of the most critical tools in the AI industry that's used almost universally by large organizations. Now we come to H203. This was uh, the second one I looked at. This, like MLflow, is a library that you just download and then you just run java-jar and run the jar file. H203 is meant for something called auto ML. So you can take like a data scientist who doesn't know any code, he imports his data, and then H203 will automatically do feature engineering, feature selection, hyperparameter tuning. You don't have to know anything about AI and it spits out a model that makes predictions on new data. It's a wonderful tool, it works really well. It's in lots of tutorials, thousands of GitHub stars. Uh, unfortunately, it is exposed to the entire lo local network out of the box, and it does not have authentication. And at this point, I'm not shocked that it doesn't have authentication, but it doesn't. So I take a look at this tool, I download it, I run it, I access the web server, and of course, with a tool that does auto ML that starts with importing data, I start by importing data. I had three CVEs within like 15 minutes of opening this tool. No exploits necessary whatsoever. This is pure functionality in these zero days. Number one, file path exposure. So I try and import a file. I start typing out my, my folder name that I want to go access, and it just starts auto-completing it. And I'm like, there's no way that it's just auto-completing my entire file system on a tool that's exposed to the entire network. Meaning, if you're on the same Wi-Fi network as someone that's running H203, you can see and read any file, or file name at least, on their system. I'm like, okay, well, that's file path exposure, CVE number one. Now we're about five minutes into the testing. Local file include, I've in tried to import a file. Now can I read the file I tried to import? Absolutely, you just parse it. That's my private SSH key again. Uh, that was step two. And now we're 10 minutes into testing. Arbitrary file overwrite. So we've imported, we read the file. Now what happens when we export it? Well, it turns out it's got this handy path that says overwrite with a checkbox. Yes, that is force overwrite. You can overwrite any file on the system by default on an H2O install. There is nothing you have to do or exploit to actually get a local file include, get SSH keys, or just denial of service the whole system by wiping their entire disk with overwritten files or something. So H203, that was, that was not a lot of work, and that was three CVEs. H203 is in our AI bug bounty program. It's had several more vulnerabilities since it's come out. However, these things are worth thousands of dollars. If you reported all of those, you would have gotten thousands and thousands of dollars for simply opening the tool. That is the state of AI security. So now we get to my favorite one. This is Ray. Ray, like the other two tools, is a library that you can download for free. You just do pip install Ray, then Ray start, and it kicks off a web server for nice, easy use. Now, Ray's purpose is to collect a whole bunch of computers and then collect them in a cluster so you can create a model using all of that computing power at once. Now, if I'm sitting at home and I'm writing my UFC predictor for predicting UFC fights, I don't need 50 computers in a cluster to train that model. That model trains in literally a minute. So who needs this? Large corporations. This tool has 30,000 GitHub stars and it's gonna be used almost entirely by large organizations who need to process huge amounts of data. So I kick it off. Uh, my buddy Bryce contacts me and he says, hey, I was looking through your AI bug bounty program. Do you have any uh, recommendations for a good target? And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, there's this Ray thing. I have never used it, but it's very similar to the last few targets that I took a look at that all had vulnerabilities. And Bryce is like, okay, great. You, go, you wanna take a look? I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. So we both install and download this tool. 
and at the same time, uh, kick it off, run some scans, do some code review. Within 30 minutes, we had two local file includes, one server-side request forgery, and two remote code executions. So we're like, this is great. You know, this is going to be worth a lot of money <laughs> for 30 minutes of work. None of those exploits were complicated. There's no, like, you know, getting buffer overflows or anything. It's literally the tool just inserts your command into uh, a subprocess string. Just simple stuff like that. So we uh, write up the result, results. We put it up on uh, hunter.mlsecops.com, the AI bug bounty. And we're like, all right, well, let's just move on because, you know, that was a fun 30 minutes, but let's go see what else there is. But we get a curious response. We come back the next day, and to raise credit, they answer and respond very quickly to our reports. However, they marked all of them informational. And so me and Bryce are looking at each other, and we're like, man, me and you, we got like 30 years of hacking experience between the two of us. I don't think these are informational. We had proof of concepts and everything. So we go over and log into Hunter, and we read Ray's response. Thank you investigating and working to identify any security concerns within Ray. In this particular case, from the position this query is run from, the caller would also be able to submit and run arbitrary execution. Okay, PS, we're fixing the issue, even though it's not an issue. So we're a little confused by this. So Bryce responds, hi, this particular query can be run from anyone on the network. The proof of concept demonstrates calling this API endpoint anonymously from a remote machine. Please let me know if I can demonstrate this more clearly. And Ray responds, uh, Ray at its core provides arbitrary code execution for its clients. This is an intentional and blah, 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 blah. Let me translate what Ray just said here, the maintainers of Ray. They said, A, Ray has built in anonymous remote code execution. Built in, it's a feature. You don't even need to use the exploits that we found. Two, Ray starts on localhost by default, therefore it's safe, and three, Users of Ray can modify Ray's default configs in a way that exposes Ray to the network at large. But of course that's a bad idea and it's very dangerous and no one would do that. I mean, let's start with point number three. There's a lot to unpack here. Point number three, you can run Ray uh, that exposes it to the local network. Yeah, you can. It's a built-in command line argument. If you go to their GitHub issues and you search 0.0.0.0, .0, which is the network exposed interface, you'll find dozens of people getting recommended they run it exposed to the network interface. Second, in certain places in the documentation, it literally recommends you expose it to the network interface. But all this is irrelevant because the second point he makes, Ray runs on localhost by default, therefore it's secure. Now this may actually be some interesting information that some of you may not know, but that does not mean it's secure. There's two ways of exploiting this. If a web server is running on a localhost, how do you exploit it? One, there's privilege escalation. Any other user can log into that machine and run commands as the user that ran Ray. That's privilege escalation. Ray recommends you run it as root in order to get full functionality. So if anybody else logs into that Linux server and you're running Ray localhost, everyone that logs in now has root access to that server. But more importantly, you can exploit this remotely too in a way that I actually wasn't aware until I started doing some research. This is the exploit code. Now, I am pretty sure only three people on planet Earth know about this Ray vulnerability. It is currently unpatched. I told the maintainers, but they marked it informational, and so I guess we're just gonna expose it now for the first time publicly. Uh, all you have to do is host this on a domain you own and send the domain link to someone running Ray locally that's not exposed to the network. They will have a file created on their computer in temp drive by. It's remote code execution as soon as they click on the link. Now you may be asking, how does this work? Don't modern browsers have something called cores, cross origin resource sharing, that's supposed to prevent exactly this kind of attack? Yes, cores works by preventing Google from using your browser to request Facebook information and then giving it back to Google. So it prevents cross domain uh, attacks like this. Unfortunately, Cores has a quirk in it called a simple request. Now, a simple request is a request that is either get, head, or post and has a limited number of headers. If your request matches those parameters, then it, your browser will gladly send that request cross-domain. And that's what we're doing right here. 
And that's all we need to exploit Ray on a local machine. Now, a question I get asked very, very often is, well, why does any of this matter? We have a million dollar firewall. Hackers can't even see the AI tools we're using. So who cares if it's vulnerable to remote code execution anonymously with no authentication? Well, your firewall means nothing to me. In my 15 years of hacking, I have never hacked a firewall. It's completely unnecessary. Let me show you. All right, so I'm gonna attack your organization through the AI department. And the reason I'm going through the AI department is because AI engineers are high privileged users with access to massive amounts of data and the tools they use are terribly insecure. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna search LinkedIn. I'm gonna look acme.com. Uh, I'm gonna find, I'm sorry, acme.com machine learning. I'm gonna find a list of all your machine learning engineers. I'm gonna use a tool called the Harvester to figure out what your email address format is. Usually it's gonna be like first name dot last name at acme.com. I'm gonna send all your machine learning engineers an email. Hey, I've been a customer for 10 years. I'm seeing an issue in this product below. Uh, can you take a look and forward me to the right person? Or whatever, you know, make it more realistic than that. Doesn't matter. But you can see the link there looks like it's going to acme.com. If you hover over the link, it's going to hacker.com. Now, your machine learning engineer thinks they're being helpful and they click on that link to figure out where to send the email. That's it. Remote code execution. I now own a high-privileged user computer on a high-privileged section of the network with high-privileged access to data inside your corporation. I didn't have to hack your firewall. You just go right around it. Now, some corporations are going to be like, well, our spam filters would have caught all of that. Okay, whatever. I'll send them a LinkedIn message. I'll send them a Facebook message during business hours. It's irrelevant. You can't have these tools on your internal network and think you're secure. You can't run a tool on localhost and think, oh, it's okay that it has remote code execution. Hackers are getting in. Now, what if you're on an internal pen test as a legitimate pen tester? You may be surprised to learn also that Nessus, Nmap, Nexpos, Metasploit, none of them have the ability to fingerprint any of the AI services that are out there today. Even Ray with its 30,000 GitHub stars, even MLflow that's used ubiquitously in the AI industry, can't fingerprint them, doesn't see them. So you're on an internal pen test, you run Nessus, you run Nmap, you can't find any vulnerable services. Uh, what do you do? Well, you can just run Nmap and then print all its, or save its output to file and then control F that file for H2O, control F for MLflow, control F for Kubeflow, whatever you want. So the name of the service is in the fingerprint, but Nmap just doesn't recognize it as what it is. It, does, it will never tell you, hey, there's an MLflow server here. You have to manually find that. Now we're trying to fix this. We're trying to add some Nessus plugins to get to these vulnerabilities. We're trying to add some Nmap scripts that will help you identify the version numbers and everything of all these AI services. But if I'm on an internal pen test and I do identify an MLflow server over here and I get a Windows XP box with MS 08067, remote root code execution, I'm sprinting to that MLflow box, not the Windows XP box. The Windows XP box probably hasn't been touched in forever. That MLflow box, high privilege user high privilege network access, high privilege data access. It's the keys to the kingdom. You get the SSH credentials off that MLflow server, you spray them around the network, you're domain admin, or you own their cloud network. It's incredibly valuable and terrible if it gets exploited. So let's talk about future research. These are some really, really bad vulnerabilities. But I'm sitting there brainstorming with my colleagues, what would be like the atom bomb of security in the AI industry? And I think I found it. In order, what you're looking at is a very simple script to create an XGBoost model for predicting whether diabetes exists in a certain subset of the population. The important thing here is dot predict. Every AI library that creates models, TensorFlow, PyTorch, XGBoost, whatever, they have some form of dot predict in there. That's how you use the model. That's how you make predictions. So what if you go to these tools, GitHub libraries, and you start tracing the code, starting at the dot predict method down to the C code that runs the dot predict method. And what if you found a buffer overflow somewhere along the way? That's triggerable by somebody just calling this method. So if you have this model as a corporation and you're giving it to some employees, anybody on the internal network could just run the exploit because your model has to run dot predict and it has to take user data inside of dot predict. You've done something terrible and here's why. 
You cannot patch a model. You cannot update a model. You have to delete a model and retrain it entirely. Second, you can't scan a network for where all your model files are. You can barely scan a computer for where these model files are. So if you find a vulnerability in dot .predict function, you have just made an enormous amount of organizations more or less permanently vulnerable. They don't know where all these models are. Every organization on earth that has trained a model using that vulnerable library is vulnerable. And they don't know where all these model files are because there's not good tooling to figure that out. So that would be, I think, a catastrophe. I mean, what if that model, what if you don't know what data you train that model with and that model makes you millions of dollars? You have to just continue to use a vulnerable model. So that would be interesting future research. Whoops. All right, so if you want to become an AI security uh, hacker, I can tell you right now, the bar is exceptionally low. Just start opening up some of these tools and clicking around. You don't even need to know security, and you'll be a top AI hacker. So come over to hunter.mlsecops.com. We'll pay you thousands of dollars to just open some of these tools up and figure out if there's a vulnerability in them. Now, we're going to change that domain here fairly soon, so you know, take a picture of it now. It'll probably change to something else soon. And if you want to join the community, if you ever want any help, just email me. Uh, join our Slack. Our MLSecOps channel is for AI security news. And we have a Discord channel as well. Uh, so thank you very much. That is hacking AI from a practical perspective. <laughs>